ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my new video. I've been meaning to make this video for a couple of weeks now. I know this is old news, but um, I'm going to give you a lot of information here that you probably haven't heard from other news articles, or websites, or YouTube channels. I'll try and go into quite a lot of detail about this Saudi Arabia-Iranian deal that China has brokered. I'll give you my thoughts and opinions. And um, I know a lot about the Middle East, but I also know a lot about China as well. So I'm going to give you um, a lot of hard truths. So first of all, this has been a huge shock to the West that China has brokered this deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And it, you can see how Israelis in particular are absolutely shocked. Uh, the Americans have been absolutely shocked, gobsmacked. Um, their response has been very muted. And this has been coming. Um, You've got to say this has, this has been coming for a long time. But before I talk a bit more about this, I want to kind of talk a bit about the history of Saudi Arabia and Iran. Those of you who don't know, I'll, I'll summarize it very, very quickly. Uh, Saudi Arabia is what you call uh, a country full of Sunni Muslims, and Iran has primarily got uh, Shiite Muslims. In Saudi Arabia, they mainly speak Arabian, and in Iran, they mainly speak Persian. The history is very different between the two. Obviously, Iranian people are descendants of Persia, and, you know, they have different histories. They've always... Um, hated each other throughout history um, and things are th this peace deal doesn't mean that there's peace between Saudi Arabia and Iran you know between Saudi Arabia and Iran it, it, things are very very complicated but the one and only reason um, these two countries with a history of hating each other the only reason they've kind of uh, come together uh, one of the reasons is China. Um, the other reason is the economy. So China is all about you know win-win you know scenarios. They want to, even though you don't get along with uh, another country, you can still trade with that country. You still try and find win-win situations between each other. Ten years ago, Saudi Arabia would never ever, you know have this kind of peace deal with Iran because 10 years ago things were very different even five years ago but the last five years or so things have changed a lot um, number one United States and you and everyone knows Saudi Arabia has been a very staunch ally of the United States ever since um, the 1970s and 80s 90s and um, but the things are very different now, especially with the new leader. You got um, MBS, who's a new leader, and he's a very young leader, and he's very forward-thinking. He understands a lot about uh, geopolitics and what's been happening around the world, and he understands that you know Saudi Arabia needs to diversify its economy. It needs to get away from the dollar. It needs to um, work with other countries and they know that you know relying on the United States is not really a good idea and they have seen how United States treats other Muslim countries in the Middle East namely Iraq, Afghanistan after blowing up those countries and killing up to like a million civilians in the process now they have seen what the Americans are doing in Syria. They are there stealing their oil. They are also seeing what they're doing to Iraq. A lot of people don't know that Iraq's, all of the oil money goes into a central bank controlled by the United States. So even the Iraqis right now, they do not have access to their oil money. There's over 100,000 you know, there's over 100 billion or so in um, in reserves being held in 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 the in the central bank in the United States, and uh, this was done at the time when the United States took over Iraq, and they decided to put all of that money into American banks where it's safe. 
And to this day, Iraqis don't have access to that. Only Americans will give access to Iraq you know, if they need it. If Iraq is naughty at some point, um, the Americans would keep that money. Same thing that they did with Afghanistan. They kept, I think, seven, eight billion worth of Afghanistan's money uh, from the central bank, stole it. And people have seen what they've done to Afghanistan. You know, 20 years ago, they went in as, as liberators. They promised um, to liberate Afghanistan, help the country develop, help the women of that country. They promised a lot of things. 20 years later, they basically got up and run, ran. And everyone's seen those images of those planes where Afghans were, were falling off the planes. And, and it's, it's really tragic. So, you, so Saudi Arabia has seen um, the trail of destruction that the United States and its allies have caused in the Middle East. Don't forget, you know, the Abu Ghraib prison as well. Uh, what they did to Iraqis in that prison is absolutely sickening. And one of the other major things that's um, really, really angering Saudi Arabia is Israel's treatment of the Palestinians. And Palestinians are Arabic. They're Arabs as well. They speak the language. Um, a lot of them are Sunni Muslims. So Saudi Arabia's um, have got more of a link to Palestinians than probably I Iranians do. And um, they can see what's happening to in Israel. They can see what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, taking their land, killing off you know, many of these Palestinians. This is what you call a modern day apartheid, as mentioned by Amnesty International. So you can see it's very complicated, the relationship between um, Saudi Arabia and Iran. There's also a lot of conflicts that have been happening between these two over the past um, few years as well. Um, there's also, you know, there's obviously a lot of Houthis in Yemen fighting Arab Saudi Arabians um, in there. Um, there was also uh, lots of um, attacks to oil infrastructure as well, which they're blaming the Iranians for. There's a hu huge list of things that um, have happened between these two countries. And these two countries do not like each other at all. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia has also been supporting Iraq during the Iraq-Iran war and things like that. So I'm not going to go too much into the history, but the point is these two countries do not like each other. But they are making friends with each other uh, for one and only reason, the United States. And they have seen that the you know, United States is basically picking off these Arab countries one by one. First, it's... Um, Obviously, first it was Iran, back then, between the Iraq-Iran war. Then it was Iraq. Then they went after Syria. United States has been the reason for many Arab Springs, color revolutions happening in the Middle East. Um, they are one of the main reasons for the Yemen war, um, which they pushed Saudi Arabia to this war. I can name a lot, but basically... United States has been the main reason for all this instability in the Middle East ever since the 70s, 80s, 90s. A lot of, a lot of it has gone to mainly the Israeli lobby, and the Israelis basically, um, after the war with the Arab states uh, in the 1960s, they decided, you know, their strategy was to divide the Middle East. So they do, they do not want the Middle East to come together and fight Israel again, like they did uh, in the 60s and 70s. So what they decided, they decided to kind of um, split the Arab states and cause infighting, cause a lot of instability between these states. And this allowed Israel to flourish while the rest of the Middle East just burns. And this was their strategy. They know that the Middle East, especially the Arab states, have got huge reserves in oil. And they knew that if all of these Arab states sold all of their oil, um, they would be the richest countries in the world. They would be the superpower. Uh, the Middle East would be the superpower. If, if they all sold their oil, made a lot of money, all got together... 
invested that money in their own countries, infrastructure, developed their own country, they would have been a huge, huge power in the Middle East. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. They have caused a lot of instabilities, wars in the Middle East, and a lot of the oil wealth has pretty much gone into smoke, uh, like it has done in Iraq, for example. Um, so you can see, you know, this is not something um, the Middle East countries want. And Saudi Arabia knows very well that they could be next. And MBS does not get along with Biden. Everybody knows that. And he's just waiting for the day when the United States basically turn on him. Maybe they're already trying to do things behind the scenes to try and get him off the off power, but you know it's failing. Uh, but MBS knows that he needs to find new friends because um, the United States is basically gunning for him. And especially after the Khashoggi murder, um, they are basically, they have, or Biden has decided to cut ties with uh, MBS and make him into pariah. So MBS has, obviously needs new friends, new powerful friends. Um, so MBS has re decided to reach out to countries like China, Russia. And this is why, you know, Saudi Arabia has been going more friendly towards Russia, mainly friendly towards China. They need China because they, they know that China is the next uh, up and coming superpower. And they also buy a huge amount of oil from Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia's number one priority is China. And they said that in a number of um, articles. They said China is our priority partner at this at this stage. So, so one of the things um, has happened recently is China has um, obviously been buying oil from Saudi Arabia. They've also been buying oil um, from Iran. And Iran has made it very clear uh, to China a few times they do not want China to deal with you know Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia said the same thing to China they do not want China to deal with Iran and so China is basically was caught into um, you know caught in the middle between these um, power states in the Middle East and, and China obviously um, uh, didn't want to break relations with either of those countries. So the best thing to do for, for China at the time was to get these two countries to talk to each other and broker peace deal. And this is a win-win for everybody, win-win for Saudi Arabia, win-win for Iran, and also it's a big win for China for a number of reasons. Number one, you know, China has shown to be a very good uh, middle middleman in terms to broker peace between countries and they are doing something that the United States should have done years ago. They should have been in the Middle East brokering peace between Israel, Palestine and, and all the neighboring countries. You know, the West and the um, United States should have done that years ago, but they didn't. They wanted instability. They wanted these Arab countries and Iranian, uh, you know, Iran to fight with each other and, and, and stuff like that. And so China has done this, they've done it behind closed doors. And one of the reasons they did it behind closed doors is because, you know, back then during, um, a few years ago, there was uh, some peace talks um, to be done between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And there was a famous Iranian um, uh, general, um, Soleimani. Uh, he, 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 went, he was going to Iraq to kind of, have some peace talks between um, Iran and Saudi Arabia and also Iraq as well. And he got murdered by Trump and obviously um, that put the spanner in the works. So this is, so he was murdered for a couple of reasons. First of all, the United States did not want any peace between Iran and Saudi Arabia and, and Iraq and things like that. So, so they knew what was happening, so they decided to kill him. So this, these, these meetings that went on behind closed doors and uh, obviously, it's come out as a great result. Uh, everybody's happy. Um, this will help the neighborhood, help the countries. And Saudi Arabia, and also forgot to mention Qatar as well. 
Qatar has proved recently that you can be a friend of the United States, you can be the friend of the West, but you're going to be backstabbed any, any chance they get. And I'm talking about the World Cup here. So everybody knows Qatar has been a very good friend to the West. Um, they have been giving um, military bases um, to the United States uh, to attack other you know, Middle East countries. Um, United States escaped from Afghanistan and went to the base in Qatar. So Qatar has been a very good friend of the West, very good friend of the United States. They've been giving a lot of um, oil and gas to the West as well. Uh, they've been very, very friendly. But as soon as the World Cup came, there were stories of um, corruption coming out. There were stories of human rights. And basically, um, they destroyed Qatar's World Cup. They destroyed their big moment. Um, back, th back then, Qatar needed some support from the West. You know, they needed um, the West to at least stand up for them and say, look, you know, Qatar is our friend. Um, but y y all... All these countries basically went, you know, started boycotting Qatar and talking about human rights and everything. And Qatar was unhappy. And next day, what Qatar did was sign a huge gas deal with China because they said, you know what, enough of the West. We're just going to sign up with China and screw the rest. So obviously, um, you know, MBS and other, other, you know, Arabian and and Persian. People have seen this, and I'm also talking about the Kurds as well. Kurds have been pretty much been abandoned as well by the United States, and um, it's, they're not a country to be trusted. So, what will what will mean between what will, what will this mean between Saudi Arabia and Iran? First of all, I will talk about Iran. For Iran, it will be great because. Saudi Arabia will start um, investing in Iran. They will start helping them develop their oil fields, gas fields. And the most important thing is they will help uh, provide Iran some security. Uh, before this deal, Saudi Arabia allowed Israel to fly over its airspace uh, for free. And what Israel could have done is they would have flown over Saudi Arabia and bombed you know, Iran uh, bombed their nuclear sites and come back. But now, since this deal, that uh, route is closed for, for Israel now. Uh, Saudi Arabia will not allow um, Israel to fly over its airspace to attack Iran. So that's a good thing for Iran. Um, so what, what does it mean for Saudi Arabia? For Saudi Arabia, it means a couple of things. Um, obviously, you know that the same reason many countries get together, the, your enemy and their enemy is basically uh, makes you makes you a friend. Um, so what what I mean is, you know, if I'm if I'm in a room and I'm sitting with somebody I don't like, and I'm just sitting there talking to them, even though I don't like them, I, I hate them in in fact, and then somebody walks into the room uh, with a knife. And they say, look, I'm going to kill both of you. So what, what do you think I'm, I'm going to do? I'm, all, I'm obviously going to work together with this guy who I don't like. But we're going to join forces and take out this guy with a knife because both our lives is at stake. So well, even though I don't like the guy, we're going to basically work together to bring down this guy uh, who's got a knife in his hand. And this means both of us survive and the guy with the knife uh, has got less chance of killing both of us if we work together. So that's the same thing. The enemy of your enemy is your friend, basically. So this is uh, purely going to be uh, for economic needs between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, the most important thing that people don't realize is it, it, there's a huge Belt and Road um, scheme going on. And there's going to be railway lines going via Iran, via Saudi Arabia. So these two countries will have to be working together uh, for the BRI. And this will help um, bring, bring about better economic uh, fruits for both countries. And also China has also said to Saudi Arabia, you know, if you... You know, we are your number one priority, as you said, but, you know, you have to basically... Um, work with us 
and just listen to us, work with Iran, have a win-win situation, um, develop good relations, develop the Middle East, become, you know, work, learn to work with each other, become strong, become independent, you know, and get away from um, from United States because these guys are not after your best interests. You know, you have to look after your own best interests, and your best interest is to basically uh, make friends with your neighbors, trade with them, make money, become as most powerful as you can, uh, make friends with countries like China and Russia, and not rely on United United States. Uh, and this is what's happened basically. So they've shaked hands because there's a lot of mutual understanding, mutual cooperation. So Kissinger has basically said that. Um, this China broker deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran is basically Riyadh is playing off Washington and Beijing for the sake of his own security. Well, you have to understand Kitchens is a very old man. So maybe this was true back in the day. Back in the day, Saudi Arabia was a very different country. Um, MB, you know, you know, MBS is... Um, father and and and, uh, and basically his ancestors um, who, who were ruling the country uh, before he was even born. <clears throat> so things were different in Saudi Arabia back then but but now things are very different with the new leader uh, MBS. He, he's obviously a young leader. He knows about the world. He's very educated. He's not stupid. So Kissinger, I think he's got this wrong. Um, I, th I think MBS knows exactly what he's doing. And MBS knows the future is not United States. The future is um, China and the global south. And, and, and this is the way he's going. So Kissinger, obviously, you know, uh, he, 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 you know th th times have changed since when he was... Um, obviously um, running around the Middle East and things like that. It's not the same as it as it once was. Things are very, very different. And also, you, the US is not to be trusted now. And also, the US is very close to collapse as well with, with the banking crisis that's happening. Uh, the dollar is totally out of control. There's a de-dollarization happening. So the world has completely changed compared to what Kissinger remembers. So how does this affect Israel? So obviously Israel is very shocked. Uh, Netanyahu, who's come back into power, is not really liked by all of the Arab countries, uh, all of the Middle East. In fact, nobody likes him. And Saudi Arabia definitely doesn't like him, and especially what he's doing to Palestinians. Um, so th there was supposed to be some sort of deal uh, with Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, to have some sort of... Um, a railway link linking Saudi Arabia and um, and Israel and into the Mediterranean. Uh, they were supposed to have some sort of understanding and sign this deal. And before signing this deal, it would mean that Saudi Arabia has full, you know, relations with Israel. But obviously, they didn't sign, and um, those full relations are still on hold. So I don't think that's ever going to be happening soon. So it's bad news for Israel, and it's bad news for a number of reasons, because number one, United States is pivoting away from the Middle East. They have caused so much damage in the Middle East, now they are pivoting to Asia, they're focusing on China and Asia. So this means Israel is kind of isolated, and, um, you know, if, you know, things are not uh, the same as they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and uh, Israel is very, very worried because if uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran start becoming friends and the rest of the Middle East start becoming friends with each other, they will obviously, um, in the future, they could, you know, obviously get very, very upset if Israel carries on doing what they're doing to Palestinians and all the Middle East countries and, and, and Iran could get together and... Um, sanction Iran or maybe have a war, you never know. So things, uh, Israel is obviously very, very worried about this and th they have no idea how to fix it. Um, Netanyahu has got no kind of diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia or Iran uh, or many of the Middle Eastern countries. 
So he's just waiting on United States to kind of take the lead on this. So again, Israel is very, very worried about what's, what's, what's going to be happening in the future. So the Yemen situation, there's going to be peace talks now. Uh, so that's one good thing that's going to come out of this. Um, so hopefully there is peace between Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and finally Yemen can start rebuilding its country. Uh, which is really good news, and I hope that happens. And the other issue is Syria, and obviously you know, United States um, troops are in Syria stealing the oil. Um, there's also Turkish troops as well, and, and there's parts of Syria occupied by Kurds, parts of Syria occupied by I ISIS, and Syria is a very, very uh, is in a very big mess at the moment. So once um, you know, once Iran and Saudi Arabia starts, you know, sh you know, basically start working with each other, I'm sure the next thing to try and resolve is the Syrian crisis. And I think um, if they can get American troops out of Syria, that would uh, be a huge help for for ongoing peace in Syria. And those are the major two kind of issues in the Middle East. And once these two issues are resolved, I think Middle East can start, you know building up its wealth. Um, they can start trading in other currencies, not petrodollar, and and start, you know, working with China, working with Russia, working as part of this multipolar world. And I'm sure pretty much they can all do well uh, and become like Dubai, for example. I mean, you've seen how small Dubai is, but you can, if anyone's visited Dubai, they've done They've used the oil money in the right way, um, the infrastructure, the buildings and tourism and stuff. They've done it all the right way. Saudi Arabia is now doing, trying to do the same thing uh, because they know oil is a very limited resource. So um, they need to spend it wisely. Over the Saudi Arabia has been spending its oil money uselessly over the past, you know, decades and decades have been wasting it basically buying American weapons uh, buying American um, businesses companies uh, bonds you know shares stocks and stuff but hardly any money went into Saudi Arabia itself so things are changing with MBS now now he's um, putting all of the oil money into the country uh, everyone's heard of the Neom project which is being built right now and many other projects that's ongoing in Saudi Arabia so you will see a huge transfer, transformation in Saudi Arabia in the next 10, 20 years. And they will they will want to be uh, another, the next Dubai, for example. Qatar is also looking amazing. Anyone that's been to the World Cup in Qatar will see how developed that country is. Uh, so the only countries that need to catch up is obviously Syria, Iraq after the, uh, after the war. Kuwait is actually looking very nice. Um, Iran obviously needs to develop a lot more as well, but it, it is starting to develop over the past five, six years. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening in Iran, which I'll kind of discuss in a bit, uh, but Iran is starting to de develop more and more. <clears throat> so this, the good news for China is um, now that Iran and Saudi Arabia are friends again, uh, Saudi Arabia can join the BRICS and uh, they can join the SCO. Um, they can start working with each other uh, and try and have a win-win relationship. And what China is looking for is maybe um, Saudi Arabia to start selling its oil in yuan or a different currency, even a BRICS currency, away from the dollar. Uh, because China is obviously dumping a lot of American debts, uh, treasuries as well. The reports for January came out for January 2023, and it showed that China has been dumping even more um, US dollars. And they need to dump the dollars because um, <clears throat> obviously the US is uh, raising interest rates and the, the dollars are causing mayhem around the markets around the world. Um, it's causing absolute mayhem. So China does not want to depend on the dollar. And plus, you can you know that with the you know uh, Russian Ukraine conflict, you know that um, uh, United States can easily take these um, <clears throat> dollars away from China at any point and do the same thing to China as they did to Russia and steal all those um, 
uh, from the central bank. So China, China does not want to have been that situation. <clears throat> so the more they diversify, uh, and if Saudi Arabia can sell oil in uh, yuan, China does not need to hold so much dollars in the central bank. But one of the reasons China has to hold so much money in the central bank is because they need that money to buy goods. Um, they need, needed to buy gas, they needed to buy oil, because most of it is sold in dollars, petrodollars. They also needed to buy other commodities as well, and all, which is also sold in dollars. So they need that, and they also need the dollars to keep their currency um, low as well, because when you have when you have um, when you have huge amounts of U.S. dollars, your currency is, is kind of remains low, and which is good because China is mainly an export country, and you as an export country you want your um, currency to be low because that means you can sell goods cheaper elsewhere. While the American dollar is very expensive, if you buy goods from America right now, it's very, very expensive. But if you buy it from China, it's very low. And, and this is how uh, economics works. So, this, so there's many reasons that China is holding these dollars. But slowly over time, they are dumping more and more dollars because uh, they're going to need it less and less. So once um, they start trading with Saudi Arabia in Yuan, uh, they'll be, they'll, you'll see China accelerating this um, drop of the, of the U.S. dollar. So uh, let's talk about Iran. Iran is a huge. There's huge potential in Iran. Iran has been s sanctioned uh, for decades now, and um, Iran is still needs to be developed like um, the rest of the Middle Eastern countries. So Russia has basically agreed to help Iran uh, with its oil fields, gas fields. They, they said they, they've reached a 40 billion deal to develop uh, Iran's um, infrastructure and, and um, gas and oil fields, which is great news for Iran, which means um, they will be able to sell more gas and oil around the world and make more, more money. And um, also they, don't, they do not need to sell it in dollars. Um, they can sell it directly to China and India uh, with their own currencies. They do not need to sell it as dollars. So Iran is not um, not tied under US's um, um, strings, basically. <clears throat> so there's a lot of deals happening with, um, with, with many countries that Iran is doing. And one of its recent, uh, one of its neighbors, India, um, Basically, things are not going too well between Iran and India at the moment. They are trading. Um, they are trading, uh, but I Iran has not been very happy with India for for a number of reasons, which I'm going to go into. Uh, number one, uh, recently, the Iranian foreign minister cancelled a trip to India because India was showing a clip of the protests that was happening in in in, in Iran. Uh, so they were showing these clips, and Iran basically said, we cannot turn up to this meeting, you have to get rid of this clip, and the Indians refused to get rid of it, they said, we are, you know, we can't get rid of it, and uh, so the Iranian foreign minister cancelled his trip to India. And also recently, um, recently, you know, when Trump basically threw out the JCPOA and tore up the agreement, um, Iran and India were developing um, a Chabahar port together. And as um, soon as um, Trump started putting all the sanctions on Iran, uh, India basically complied, and they, they basically complied with the sanctions and stopped investing in the Chabahar port. And uh, recently, India started investing in the Chabahar port again, uh, but Iran is basically saying, you know, why is India not um, following the same West's rhetoric against Russia, but why did, why did India listen to the United States when it came to us and not listen to the United States when it comes to Russia? So it's kind of like double standards, according to the Iranians. So this is why Iranians are not very happy with the Indians. They feel like they are uh, two-faced, as you would say. Um, so they, don't, they do not trust the Indians at, at the moment, and they know that India is going more 
towards the United States um, and less kind of less towards us. And Iranians feel that they have been abandoned by India because India wanted to follow a relationship with the United States. And they could understand that, but obviously things are different because they've seen how India has been reacting when it comes to placing sanctions on Russia. And Iranians are saying, why are you, you know, not placing sanctions on Russia? And why did you place sanctions on us? Why, you know, why are you treating them differently and treating us differently? So the Iranians are obviously very, very upset about this and they feel like um, they, they cannot trust India at the moment. However, there is a, a relationship with, between India and, and Iran, even if it's an economic relationship. India is uh, starting to buy oil again. They didn't buy oil from Iran all these years because they were scared of the sanctions, but they, they are starting to buy oil and gas again. And this has happened very recently. So, so this is what this article is basically about. So Saudi Arabia is obviously going to invest in Iran and Iranians need a lot of Saudi Arabian investment because Saudi Arabians are very good when it comes to investing in oil infrastructure, oil and gas infrastructure, and Iran, Iran needs that. So they, they need to improve their oil and gas infrastructure so they can sell more to uh, other countries, including China. So China itself has signed a 400 billion deal. Uh, this was a few years ago. And China is helping Iran build its infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in, in Iran. And I have a very close friend uh, who's just come back from Iran. And he's, he's told me the changes that's happening in Iran. He's told me about the high-speed rail link that's uh, been developed in Iran. Not many people know that. Uh, so this has been done by a Chinese company. So they're going to be doing a high-speed rail link between Tehran and um, three other cities or four other cities. Um, so this is going to be a huge game changer for Iran. They're also building a lot of uh, infrastructure in terms of ports, other railways, highways, um, linking Iran from north to south to east to west and they're completely transforming Iran uh, with Chinese help and basically Iran is paying back China with uh, oil so China is not paying for oil for, from Iran they're basically paying back in terms of giving Iran infrastructure and they <laughs> they're also helping Iran with the uh, military aspects as well uh, give it, sharing technology uh, in medicine and other things. So this is a huge, huge deal. <clears throat> and all, you can see here Iran is, Iran is also visiting UAE to normalize relations with UAE at the, as well. So you can see all the Middle Eastern countries and Iran starting to get together and started um, and starting to um, basically start getting along. So this is the high-speed rail, rail I was going to I was talking about Tehran to Qom and and Ifsafan, and if anybody if any um, Western people hear about this, they'll be absolutely shocked and they will be like, how how can a country like Iran have high-speed rail? This is one of the most sanctioned countries on earth, and how the hell did they get high-speed rail? But then, well, it's really happening, and it's due to complete by next year. By the way, it's still under construction. And uh, hopefully by next year it, it should complete. So China has also got um, a rail link linking Iran to China as well. And, it, it, and obviously it goes via the Caspian Sea at the moment. So um, this rail link goes through other Central Asian countries, stops in the Caspian Sea. Then a boat takes um, the goods across the Caspian Sea and from from the southern parts of the Caspian Sea, it goes into Iran, Iran's ports and, and, and into Iran. So this is um, one direct link that's happening, but there is there is other links that's um, happening with Iran, and, th and this is it. You can see a link from Urum Urumqi in China, uh, which is going through Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and directly into Tehran. And, uh, and you can see all these road and rail links um, coming in and out of Tehran. And Tehran is very important. Um, Iran is very important for not only for China, but also for, for Russia as well. <coughs> so this um, <coughs> Ukraine conflict means that Russia needs to 
sell its oil and gas to other you know customers and its biggest customers are china and also india so if if moscow wants to sell oil and gas to india it has to go through iran you can see the geography has to go through iran because this is the only way uh, they can get uh, they can get goods to india fast cheap and effectively as well so Tehran is having a huge infrastructure change and over the next 5-10 years you will see Iran becoming a central hub in Central Asia and in Middle East uh, for trade from, from the north, from Russia all the way to India, from east, from China all the way into Europe from here as well. You can see this uh, train line going from to, to Turkey and then into Europe. Uh, Central Asia, um, from Africa going through Tehran, from India going through Tehran. So Tehran is going to be a central hub. And this is why Tehran, uh, uh, in terms of its geography, is a very important country. Uh, its size matters a lot and, and what it can provide with links to the rest of the world is really is, is great. Uh, and once all of these links are, are complete, uh, te you will see Tehran's economy shoot up and they will shoot up and go into the top 10 uh, world GDP countries and they'll be able to sell more oil and gas, they'll have a lot of infrastructure and they also have a lot of other minerals and lithium and many other um, you know, treasures also in Iran. And once these transport links are, are set up in, in Tehran and, and, and rest of Iran, then they'll be able to, you know, transport more of that uh, across to other friendly countries. And you can see here, a huge lithium discovery has been made in Iran, which is the largest lithium discovery in the world at this stage. Uh, and, I, and I love this article, what they say, huge lithium discovery could end world shortages. Oh wait, it's in Iran. <laughs> so you can see the Western countries are very jealous. They're not going to be able to access this uh, huge lithium. lithium. Uh, Iran's going to be giving it to friendly countries like China and other friendly countries, um, even Russia even. And the West is absolutely jealous about this, uh, absolutely jealous. So recently there's also um, lithium has been found in India as well. But the problem with um, the find in India is they found it in in, um, in Jammu and Kashmir, which is heavily contested between Pakistan and India. And recently some terror groups have come online and said that if India tries to mine uh, lithium, uh, take away these lithium from 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 Kashmir or Jammu Kashmir, that they will attack anyone that tries to do it. So, so it's very, very complicated uh, when it comes to India and Pakistan relations. And, and I think that's probably going to be the next step for, for China, is to try and build relationships between India and Pakistan. But that relationship is actually a lot, lot harder than building a relationship between Iran and um, and be between Iran and Saudi Arabia, building a relationship between Pakistan and and in India is almost impossible, guys. Uh, in order to build a relationship between Pakistan and India, they're going to have to find a peaceful deal when it comes to Jammu and Kashmir. Obviously, that part has been split between Pakistan administ administered Kashmir and Indian administered Kashmir. So there will never be any peace until they kind of sort out. Um, what's happening in Kashmir and also the hate between Pakistan and Kashmir goes much more deeper you know India will never forgive uh, Pakistan for attacks on its parliament and many other terrorist attacks and obviously Pakistan will never forgive India uh, for its past as well for its past wars and and India basically helping Pakistan lose Bangladesh as well so there's many many um recent um, issues between these countries and I think having peaceful deal between India and Pakistan is probably a bridge too far for China and uh, it's probably going to be way too complicated for, for this. But at the end of the day, uh, having a deal between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia is still a good start. And uh, 
let's hope this uh, relationship uh, flourishes and they can trade and develop um, each other and help each other you know, and trade with each other, make money and, and become uh, a regional power. power. So that's all I wanted to say, guys. Hopefully it's been quite educational for you guys. Um, so let me know what you think and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot. See you soon.